Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Michael Wilson, volunteer chair of the Invest in Research program at the Princess Margaret. I'm excited to tell you that we're at an incredible intersection in history where science and technology are allowing us to research and test cancer treatment methods unimaginable just a few years ago. One such example was in 2015 when Invest in Research funded scientist Dr. John Dick discovered a completely new view of how human blood is made, upending conventional thinking from the 1960s. Without the seed funding from you, our donors and supporters, imaginative and potentially breakthrough ideas can stall or fall by the wayside. With philanthropic support, researchers and clinicians can challenge traditional models of cancer care to create new possibilities for patients and hopefully change our world for the better for everyone. This morning, you'll hear updates from Dr. Shane Harding, Eric Luckman, and Natasha Lale, the 2021 grant recipients, on how their respective projects are progressing. But before we get to our incredible scientists, I'd like to introduce Sherry Friedman. Sherry is a special advisor to the foundation CEO, Mio Yamashita, and currently leads the major and estate planning giving team. Sherry's well known to our donors, volunteers, clinicians, staff, and researchers throughout Team UHN and led our billion dollar challenge, which was the single largest fundraising campaign in the history of Canadian healthcare at the time. There are few people that know the Princess Margaret Foundation better than Sherry, and we're lucky to have her here with us today. Sherry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. And if you hear buzzing behind me, there's a lawnmower. It is a pandemic certainty that any time I get on a call, somebody somewhere is running a lawnmower. Seems like a bad joke. So thank you, first of all, for joining us this morning. I am especially excited to be here because I was part of Invest in Research since its inception. I wanna first of all, thank Mike Wilson. Mike, thank you so, so much. It's so exciting to see how the program has grown and evolved. And I know a lot of it is due to your ambition to want to raise even more money so we can issue even more grants for innovative early stage research. So thank you. And thank you to the whole team. Uh, it takes a village to put on these sorts of programs. You'll meet Jared shortly. Monk has been part of it, Karina, and of course our wonderful scientific colleagues. So cancer, as you know, is Canada's leading cause of death. And with an aging population and people who delayed screening because of the pandemic, we expect a tsunami of cancer cases. That's the bad news. The good news is that we have the brilliant minds at Princess Margaret Cancer Center thinking about how we conquer cancer 24 seven. And thanks to you and thanks to an amazing team under the leadership of Dr. Aaron Schimmer, and you'll hear from Aaron shortly, um, we really are providing our scientists with the ability, we are empowering them to pursue questions that lead to breakthroughs. And as Mike mentioned, these breakthroughs lead to better, more effective, more targeted, less toxic treatments for cancer. And that ultimately allows people more time with their loved ones. And this is really what this is all about when you really peel away the layers and think about it. So you are about to hear about the, the progress being made by our latest grant recipients. Very exciting and it's pretty remarkable the amount of progress they're able to make in a short period of time because you know these grants are short term high impact projects. It's interesting, I was in a meeting, Aaron was in the same meeting, we're always in a meeting together, it seems, yesterday morning, and we talked about changing the conversation from the number of people who die from cancer to the number of people who survive cancer. And I actually think that is a, that is a great objective for us as a group, us as a community, 
and definitely a part of our invest in research ethos. So uh, I will say one last thing and then I'm going to toss the ball back to Mike. You know, we often talk about um, the other exciting part of invest in research is that every dollar you give gets leveraged. I see Patrick on the call. He tracks these things, gives us the numbers. So it, we we often throw that out, but we we don't often give you the exact amount. I will tell you that in the last 12 months alone, Invest in Research recipients have secured additional funding of $5.1 million. That's in the last year alone. So that's a pretty incredible return on investment. I want to thank you all for being part of this wonderful program. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your relatives, tell your colleagues. We'd love to bring more people on board and involve more people in this exciting front row seat to early stage innovative research. I'm going to toss it back to Mike. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sherry. Um, before we get rolling with our presentations, I'm just really delighted to introduce Jared Drunowski. Jared's our new director of the Invest in Research program. He recently rejoined the foundation to help guide the program to new heights. He's a 15 year veteran of the nonprofit sector with a successful track record of building long-term relationships at Baycrest Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. He also likes to ride bikes, I'm told, not motorcycles, but just regular racing bikes. He's an avid cyclist and member of the Princess Margaret Special Events Team that helped launch the Northern Pass, that one-of-a-kind annual cycling and fundraising experience throughout the natural beauty of Muskoka. More recently, Jared was Vice President of Philanthropy at Hillel, Ontario. Um, anyways, he's, he's a great addition to the team, and I want to thank him for helping to organize uh, today's event. Also at this moment, I'd like to thank Karina Wong for all that she has done for Invest in Research and wish her continued success at the Foundation. So Jared, I'd now like to turn this meeting over to you for your remarks. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm incredibly excited to have the opportunity to work on this program with all of you, as well as our incredible researchers. And I look forward to being able to meet with each of you over the coming months. UHN and the City of Toronto would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional uh, territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Before we get going with today's program, I'd like to take a few moments to run through some of the housekeeping items. Please note that today's session will be recorded and we will happily share the recording with you after the event. To ensure that you have an optimal experience, we ask that you please mute your mics and keep your cameras off during the presentation. We have set aside some time for Q and A's after each presentation, and we encourage you to type in any questions you may have in the chat box to the right of your screen. We'll be monitoring the chat throughout the event and we'll address the questions after each presentation. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce our incredible Dr. Aaron Schimmer, the Research Director at Princess Margaret Cancer, Cancer Center. In addition to leading the research program, Dr. Schimmer is also an active clinician and researcher at Princess Margaret. Dr. Schimmer's own translational, translational research program focuses on developing new therapeutic strategies that target leukemia and leukemia stem cells. And he recently had a paper published in the respected scientific journal, Nature Cell Biology. Dr. Schimmer is also a past grant recipient of Invest in Research. His team received funding that launched a study into new ways to eradicate leukemia cells without harming normal cells or organs and developed the world's first drug of this nature. This project led to a first in human clinical trial. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aaron Schimmer. Thank you so much, uh, Jared, and thank you, Michael and Sherry. Yeah, again, let me, on behalf of not just myself, but all of the scientists and clinicians at Princess Margaret and UHN, thank you so much for your continued support of investing research. 
this program continues, in my opinion, to be the most popular programs that, that we offer for our, uh, our faculty here. You know, and I think it's the most popular because it really is a level playing field in which everyone gets a fair shot. The competition is open to anyone at UHN doing cancer research and simply the best science is funded. And as you've heard, you know, this provides a fantastic return on investment. For every dollar that's been invested in invest in research, it funds early stage research projects, moves them to the next level where they're uh, successful or able to compete for external funding. And that's leveraged over tenfold, probably close to 20 fold for every dollar invested. Our scientists and clinicians can go out and raise an additional $20. That, that's amazing. You don't find that return anywhere else, in my opinion, in science or even in, in our programs. We've got three great uh, scientists and clinicians who are gonna to present to you their work today around the last funded programs. And we're gonna start uh, our presentations with Dr. Shane Harding. Uh, Dr. Harding received his PhD at the University of Toronto studying radiation biology. He then went on to do postdoctoral work at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, continuing his work on understanding how radiation kills cancer cells. You know, radiation has been around for 50 plus years, but yet still we don't fully understand how it's eliminating cancer cells. And Shane made the surprising but remarkable and very exciting discovery that radiation induces damage to the DNA of the cancer cell, making the cancer cell look like it's infected by virus, suggesting that radiation may actually be a form of immune therapy. And following this remarkable discovery in his postdoctoral fellowship, Dr. Harding had the opportunity to go anywhere in the world, but he chose to come back here on staff to the Princess Margaret, where he's established his own independent research program and has become incredibly successful as one of our newer scientists. Let me turn things over to you, Shane, for your presentation. Thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, let me just call up my screen here and share it with everyone. Okay, someone will flag me if you can't see this properly, but I think we're there. Uh, so first, thank you for this opportunity and, and really your faith to share in this vision. And as Aaron said today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about radiotherapy. And, you know, we use this therapy to, with the intent to cure almost half of all cancer patients. And I think this sort of harkens to what Sherry said at the beginning and that focusing on the successes that we have and radiotherapy is an incredibly successful technique, despite the fact that it's been around for so long. We use it a lot and it, and it is very, pardon me, very effective. Um, my research focuses really at the cellular level uh, on how radiotherapy works. And our goal is to, to harness that, to use this biology to enable cure and even more patients. And so to contextualize this, um, I'm gonna simplify that a little bit with, with sort of a scenario here. So imagine, you can imagine a patient that comes into the clinic with a single solid tumor. And this could be, that we know about. And so this could be a breast tumor, it could be a skin tumor, prostate, colon, a variety of situations. This is a relatively straightforward scenario. You can remove this tumor or maybe use radiation to treat that tumor if it's not suitable to remove with surgery. And this treatment can cure the patient. Um, a slightly less uh, straightforward situation is a patient that has only two tumors. Um, and emerging techniques and radiation are allowing us to now independently treat these two tumors. And this can, can create a cure in that patient too. Uh, this is an emerging technique. Um, but what if we have a patient that comes in with a tumor that we don't know about? So this may be a smaller lesion that we can't detect on imaging, or we just don't know that this, this lesion exists, or we can't locate it in the patient. This is really where, at least in the radiotherapy and surgery setting, we lose the clinical advantage. So what do we do uh, in this case? Uh, oftentimes we had toxic chemotherapies. Uh, this helps, but it's not perfect. And a lot of these patients unfortunately progress. Um, and this uh, additional therapy isn't always successful. Um, but I'm gonna tell you about a unicorn in radiation oncology. And this is called the, the Abscopal effect. So in this case, we treat the tumor that we know about and that tumor goes away and we would expect this to happen. But then somewhat by magic, through a process that we don't really understand yet, other tumors in that patient's body may disappear. And we really don't understand this process. And one of the things that I'm most fascinated with is how this effect happens. And this is a, an effect we call the abscopal effect. And this happens almost never. 
Um, but I, I like to think about this as a, a, but what if it did scenario? So we would treat one tumor in a patient and the other tumors in that patient would melt away. We could eliminate toxic chemotherapies and really affect cure in more people. So I'm gonna show you a clinical example of this. So this is a patient with metastatic melanoma who failed treatment. And this main lesion circled in red was treated with radiation. And there were a variety of other lesions within this patient that are indicated by the yellow arrows here. And so remember, the radiation was given only to this red circle. But what was remarkable was that these other lesions melted away, uh, away from where that radiation was delivered. Why did they do this? We don't know. But incidentally, this patient was on immunotherapy. And this type of response seems to be coming more common in the immunotherapy age. It's not universal, but it seems to be coming more, more common. And so the question really is, how do we capture this in more patients? And my research is really trying to understand the interface between radiation and immunotherapy so that we can improve, improve this. But ultimately it comes down, in my opinion, to what radiation is doing to the tumor. And to be quite honest, we really don't know. And I'll say that, that that statement is for dramatic effect. We do actually know a lot, but I would say we're continually under, uncovering uh, fundamental impacts of radiotherapy. And so as Aaron alluded to, you know, for example, five years ago, we discovered that when cells are treated with radiation, they start to look like they're infected with a virus. And this activated viral type response was uh, essential for immunotherapy to be activated in my, mouse models uh, that we were studying. But ultimately, we don't really have a handle on whether this type of viral response happens in patients. And part of this is because we rarely remove tumors after radiotherapy and profile of them at the depth that I'm going to describe to you in a moment. And so really, all of this work is premised on my personal and deep belief that in order to advance care, we have to understand what the treatments are doing to the tumor and to the nearby tissues. So this is uh, the, pro the, the program that, that we've proposed and that, that um, you've supported. And so this is a high-risk prostate cancer patients come into our clinic um, and they receive biopsies before they're ever treated. So they get biopsies from the normal region of their prostate and they get biopsies from the region uh, of cancer within their prostate. And then those patients leave the clinic and they go on and they have their radiation therapy as they normally would. And then a couple of weeks later, they come back and we get new biopsies uh, from these patients. And so I've partnered with Ali Berlin, who's a radiation oncologist here and, and very keen on translational science, and biologist Hanson Hay and, and Matthew Lupien, who are uh, prostate cancer biologists. And so we're actively collecting this material. And I will say that just this past Monday, I was in the operating room, you know, vial in hand, waiting for the tissues to be delivered to us. And so, uh, you know, our, our courageous patients are really uh, helping us out with this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So what do we do with this material? We're using a new technology that was really essentially unavailable five years ago. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these biopsies and we're going to profile thousands of individual cells from these given biopsy sites. This, this method allows us to identify the types of cells that make up those biopsies and the functional status of those cells. And so in this plot here, you see a whole bunch of dots and every dot in this plot is a single cell. And we have thousands of readings on each of those single cells that give us a functional state of that cell at the time of profiling. And really this depth and the spatial distribution of the responses that we see is, is unprecedented. And so then what we do is we take these tissues and we look at the normal cells, we look at the tumor cells, we look at them before and after radiotherapy. And in dozens of patients now, we can compare how the response is being induced across that tumor. And we really intend to use this data to identify new ways that we can rationally manipulate how the cells are, or a subset of cells within these uh, tumors and biopsy regions uh, are responding to treatment. And so our vision then is to take these scenarios that I explained to you in the, in the first place, these ones where we can affect cure in a subset of patients, we think we've got a handle on clinically, but these aren't always fully successful. But there are situations which are currently considered effectively incurable. And we think that by harnessing the biology that we profile in this particular um, uh, program, uh, we'll be able to affect cure and lead to cures in, in a greater variety of our patients. 
And so that's really all I wanted to convey to you today. Uh, thank you again for your support. I really appreciate it and happy to take any questions. Super. Thank you, uh, uh, Shane, so much for that. I, I'm happy to run the questions unless, Michael, you, you would like to. Uh, but, you know, maybe. Go ahead, Aaron. But I do have a question oh. while perhaps others are thinking of others. Um, Dr. Harding, thanks for the presentation. Um, on the radiotherapy, are you doing anything different right at inception uh, uh, for dosage rates or anything different for the kinds of testing work that you're doing that you would, the patient otherwise wouldn't receive? In the, in the initial setting, no, we're not, we're really doing what is standard of care in these patients. And we're doing that for a couple of reasons. One is practical and that these patients are coming through the clinic at a relatively high rate. So we can accrue our patients at a higher frequency that way. But I think, you know, prostate cancer has been treated with radiotherapy for a very long time. And our methods are actually quite effective in those patients. Um, but there are a subset, these high risk patients uh, where it is less likely to be effective. And, um, you know, we can vary uh, protocols and those protocols have been varied quite dramatically uh, in the past decades. Um, but I think, you know, we're at a moment now where we really just need to understand what is our current optimal treatment doing uh, so that we can more rationally sort of address that. Because I, I don't think we have a great handle uh, on that at the, at the cellular level, certainly at the depth that we're talking about here. Super. So, you know, if there are other questions, feel free to use the raise your hand feature or just simply shout them out. Maybe while people, though, are thinking, Shane, I'll, I'll ask you, you, you make it all look so easy and straightforward. But I wonder, you know, were there aspects that were sort of unexpected that led you to new findings, the dead end you hit that led you to the right path? Was, because, again, it, it gets laid out as, oh, this is so simple, but often it's not. I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges in this work, and, and so I mentioned there are, we're profiling in each patient tens of thousands of cells and what are thousands of genes in each of those individual cells. And the biggest challenge for us um, is the computational methods that are behind that and really understanding, you know, how to analyze this data. And this is to be quite honest, the frontier of, of biology at the moment. Computational biology is in a rapidly evolving field. We're working closely with Gary Bader at U of T, who's an international expert in this. Um, and we've recently, I mean, well, Aaron knows better than anyone, recruited uh, three computational biologists uh, at UHN. And, and this is really, I think, the most exciting part because we're able, you know, using these computational methods to uncover things that to be quite honest, none of us looking at just, you know, as, an, as numbers on a chart would pull out. And our computational biology methods are really uh, fundamental to this. And that's where we hit a lot of walls right now, is in those methods and developing new ones. And I think, um, you know, having these sort of data sets allows us to push the boundaries in that space as well, uh, which I think is, is an evolving field that we'll continue to do over the next uh, decade. Thanks, Shane. Maybe one last question for me, then building on that point. You know, your title slide wasn't just your name. You know, there were several people there. You know, I've always said science is a team sport. Can you talk a little bit around, you know, what collaboration meant to this project and how it got to where it was because of that collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, that is essential. And I, I am, for anyone here who don't know me, I am a bench scientist. I am not in the clinic. I do not see patients on a daily basis. My, my work is, is really in the lab. And so I've known Ali Berlin for a number of years now. Um, and he's an incredible clinician who's, who's in, very eager to move into the translational space. And these, these conversations, when I came here, really started from when do we get material from patients who have been treated with radiation. And he and I talked at length about what the best situations were for us to accrue these patients and, and gather this tissue to, to get these insights. And so that was, you know, essential from the very beginning. And then marrying that with expertise from Hansen and Matthew, who have been studying prostate cancer and prostate cancer genetics for many, many years now, 
I think brings sort of my expertise in radiotherapy to their expertise in prostate biology and Ali's uh, expertise at the clinical level. Um, we marry that and then bring in Gary Bader, who is really a, a, a world-renowned expert in computational biology and, and particularly in these methods that we're using here. And I think that allows us to take this to a different level. Gary's team is incredibly collaborative and has been a huge asset um, to my group um, and a, a huge uh, collaborator for our work. So it's, you know, this, this does not exist without that team approach, I would say. Thanks so much, Shane. You know, I, I'm keeping an eye on the time because I know like we could spend another hour alone just talking about your work, but you know, I, I mindfully respect what people said. So I think we, we should move on if, if that's good for you, Michael and, and Jared. Yeah, that's Very great. Much. Thanks a lot, Shane. Super. So, so our next presentation will be from Dr. Eric Lechman. Uh, Dr. Lechman is actually out of the country overseas at the moment, but he did want to be part of uh, this meeting. So he's prepared a video uh, summarizing his research and research progress. And what I thought I would do is just take a minute to two just to sort of set the stage and, and place this work in context for you. Dr. Lechman is doing very exciting work understanding leukemia in the context of Down syndrome. So children with Down syndrome can develop leukemia, they have a higher incidence or rate of leukemia. And the leukemia that they develop is very unique in the way it comes on. And, and understanding why this leukemia happens is critical to ultimately developing new treatments for leukemia in the context of Down syndrome. And one might think that, you know, the, the most straightforward way to do this is that you take leukemic cells from patients with Down syndrome who've developed the disease and study them. But that becomes problematic because by the time the leukemia has occurred, those leukemia have multiple defects in the cells. And it's very difficult to determine what has been caused by that extra chromosome 21 associated with Down syndrome and what sort of a later event that has occurred. So Dr. Lechman has developed this very interesting model where he's able to introduce that extra chromosome 21 into normal blood cells. And he's made the very surprising finding that normal blood cells in fact have hair. And for those of us who are follically challenged will appreciate this, the, the cells that start on their path to developing leukemia are actually bald. Now, as any good scientist, you can't say that normal cells have hair and leukemic cells are bald. You've got to use fancy scientific jargon. And so you'll hear that Dr. Lechman describes the normal cells of having cilia. That's another word for hair. And instead of telling you that they are bald, they have a ciliopathy. And with that, you will hear about hair and baldness and leukemia. So good morning. I sincerely apologize uh, that I can't be there with you in person today or live on a virtual call. I had a previously scheduled out of town trip that unfortunately could not be rescheduled. Uh, but I do wanna thank the foundation donors for choosing to fund my project titled Investigating Ciliopathy as a Predisposition for Pediatric Leukemia. And of course, I'd like to update you on our progress. So, Leukemia is uh, the most common cancer in, in children. And so pediatric leukemia that I work on is known as myeloid leukemia of Down syndrome or Down syndrome acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. And children with Down syndrome that have a 150 fold increased incidence of developing myeloid leukemia compared to healthy children. And prior to our recent publication, myeloid leukemia of Down syndrome was proposed to need three mutations to occur. We know the first two mutations happen before the baby is even born. The acquisition of an extra pro, uh, copy of chromosome 21 is the first genetic lesion, and 30% of developing fetuses with Down syndrome will acquire a mutation in a gene that controls red blood cell and platelet development called GATA1. When this occurs during the third trimester of pregnancy, the, develop, the baby develops a clinical disease called transient acute myelopoiesis or transient leukemia which they were born with. <clears throat> it has all the hall hallmarks of leukemia, except in most cases, it resolves quickly without therapy, which is a very unusual occurrence in hematological malignancies. And we still don't understand why this occurs. However, and within four years of the, uh, within four years, the genetic clone within the child will acquire an additional mutation and the child will develop acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. Our recent landmark study 
in, uh, we generated the first human model of Down syndrome, leukemogenesis, by introducing the appropriate mutations into different cell types from human fetal liver with trisomy 21. And using this new model, we identified that transient leukemia can only occur in a very rare cell type known as the long-term hematopoietic stem cell. And this cell can maintain the blood system for the lifetime of, a, of an individual. But what remains unclear is how an extra copy of chromosome 21 predisposes fetal liver um, hematopoietic stem cells towards malignancy. Our preliminary sequencing of the, the RNA in these cells shows a gene signature that's consistent with rare diseases called ciliopathies. However, these diseases have never been associated with blood malignancies. So what are cilia? <clears throat> so primary cilia is a solitary hair-like appendage that is present on most mammalian cells when they are not dividing. Now, functional cilia are required for appropriate responses to the environment around them. And defects in a primary cilium um, leads to a wide spectrum of diseases called ciliopathies. Um, although an extreme example you can see here that I would represent the normal long-term hematopoietic stem cell um, with lots of hair-like cilia coming out of my cells. And Aaron here would represent the pre-malignant long-term hematopoietic stem cell with faulty or uh, non-existent um, cilia. So, so, to, uh, so to test our theory, our objective is to interrogate, we wanted to interrogate 60,000 single blood progenitor cells with, cells with a state-of-the-art DNA structure, RNA analysis, and protein analysis and create this high resolution data set to see what the real differences are between cells with an extra copy of chromosome 21 and cells that, that, that do not have an extra copy of chromosome 21. And we hope this data will help us understand how chromosome 21 influences leukemia initiation in children. And we hope that it will validate a new paradigm in blood malignancy and perhaps lead to new therapies for these children. Now, to date, we've performed one preliminary experiment to optimize the lysis conditions for our rare samples. And then we hope to have all these experiments completed, um, proposed experiments completed by September. We have also uh, leveraged our preliminary data to receive an LLS Pediatric Blood Research Innovation Grant for $200,000. So that increases the money we can spend on this particular project. So that's our progress thus far. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and most importantly, for your generosity. Thank you. Super, so, so now you've understood, you know, the difference between hair and baldness and leukemia, just yet another example of hair shaming in, in uh, research areas. You know, one day the bald state will be the normal state. You know, I was hoping that's how Eric's work was gonna pan out. But uh, you know, it came out differently. You know, if there are some questions around that work, I, I would be happy to do my best to try to answer them for you. But obviously, Eric is the real expert on this. Otherwise, what we could do is we be happy to then move to Dr. Leah and uh, Garcia's presentation, as I, I'm sure that's going to uh, generate some extra discussion as well at the end. So, uh, Michael Joe, does that sound good? We'll move to, uh, to our next yeah, presentation. I think so. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Natasha Lale, a colleague and a friend. Uh, Dr. Lale is the site lead for the Lung Medical Oncology Group at the Princess Margaret, where she's a practicing medical oncologist. She's also a professor at the University of Toronto. And her area of interest is in developing new treatment strategies targeted precision medicine for lung cancer. And with over 350 publications as an international expert in the area. But what you may know less about uh, Natasha is that she's also an excellent teacher and mentor and actually in 2019 uh, recognized with an excellence in teaching award from the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology. With her today is also Dr. Miguel Garcia. Uh, Dr. Garcia is a medical oncologist trained in Spain 
after that training, could have gone anywhere in the world uh, for additional postgraduate training, but chose to come here to the Princess Margaret and working now alongside uh, Dr. Leo studying and developing precision therapy for lung cancer. And of course, if that were enough for Miguel, on the side, he's also doing his PhD. So again, a a fantastic ways that, you know, Princess Margaret truly has global reach. So with that, let me turn things over to both you, Natasha and Miguel, for your presentation. Great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this exciting project. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Sorry, some technical issues. Let me try again. And maybe while Miguel is overcoming some technical challenges, I'll just mention that you know we we have a tremendous fellowship program here at the Princess Margaret, uh, and it is supported thanks to uh, many of you who are on the call today, our donors, who help us bring uh, oncologists from around the world and researchers. Uh, they train with us, they learn from us, they teach us, and then we go on to build even stronger international collaborations. And we're delighted to have a collaboration like that with Dr. Garcia and colleagues in Spain. But that, Miguel, back to you. Great. So today we are going to present the Accelerate study. And on behalf of all the team, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our progress. So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in Canada and in Western nations, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancer combined. We know that getting to diagnosis and treatment can be a long journey for lung cancer patients. The average time from first noticing symptom to treatment initiation is more than four months. And we know that treatment delays lead to worse outcomes for patients, not only because of the anxiety and distress from waiting, but also because fewer patients get to start the right treatment for their cancer. A potential solution is the rapid diagnosis programs, but still uh, is not enough. It's important to say that lung cancer is not just one disease. We know that there are different biomarkers uh, or different gene targets that drives uh, lung cancer. And for most of these biomarkers, uh, we have a specific treatment. It's what we call targeted therapy, usually well-tolerated pills, very effective, uh, that can control the cancer for years as opposed to chemotherapy. The way we look for these specific mutations, for these specific biomarkers, is by doing a a biopsy of the lung tumor. And we know that this is one of the factors contributing to the long wait times. When a patient is referred to our rapid diagnostic program, we need to do the scans, we need to do the tissue biopsy, and then we need to run all these tests looking for the biomarkers before starting treatment. And based on our internal data, all this process can take more than two months. So how can we accelerate uh, time to diagnosis and treatment? A potential solution is uh, the liquid biopsy. But what is a liquid biopsy? So here in the right side of the slide, you can see this blue figure uh, representing the cancer cells. Now we know that little bits of cancer can be set into the bloodstream. And liquid biopsy is a blood test that can identify this little bit of cancer. And uh, we can detect for these relevant biomarkers that we need before starting treatment. So this is quite exciting if we can do a blood test and run all the tests we need to to start treatment, we could avoid uh, tissue biopsies or at least we can accelerate uh, time to treatment initiation. 
And here we are presenting our first results from the first 60 patients, which, which I think are quite exciting. In the first uh, row, uh, you can see uh, the, the results using liquid biopsy upfront in patients uh, in, in the diagnostic workup for patients with suspected advanced lung cancer. When patients are referred to our rapid assessment program, we can do the liquid biopsy quite fast, just two days after the referral, and we get the results of these molecular biomarkers much faster in only seven days. So with this approach, as opposed to the standard tissue biopsy approach, we get faster time to results, nine days versus 36 to 46 days. And we are also able to shorten time to treatment by 50%. We are starting treatment on average on 34 days from referral versus 62 days with the standard approach. And this is, I think this is quite exciting. This is really providing a real benefit to patients, usually cancer patients, lung cancer patients, are experiencing symptoms from their cancer, pain, shortness of breath, and when they usually would have to wait for another month before starting therapy, being able to start treatment much faster with this approach is quite exciting. But it's not only that uh, lung cancer patients undergoing liquid biopsy can start treatment faster, it's also that they get, uh, more of those patients get the right treatment. Using uh, liquid biopsy upfront, we see that uh, the access to these specific treatments for the specific biomarkers, what we call uh, targeted therapy, uh, is higher. We are able to increase access to these treatments and avoid uh, chemotherapy. Indeed, 27% of the patients would start a targeted therapy based on the liquid biopsy results before the tissue biopsy results were available. So I, we think this, uh, this is really exciting and, and really uh, promising with this liquid biopsy uh, approach as part of the initial diagnostic workup in patients with suspected uh, lung cancer. We are able to achieve faster time to treatment. We also increase the number of patients getting targeted therapy and avoiding chemotherapy. And because it's a, a cloth test, which is quite easy to get, uh, it's a scalable solution uh, in remote or rural areas with potential for meaningful impact for patients in terms of survival and quality of life. We hope this may be established as a standard of care in Ontario, Canada, and beyond. I would like to thank all the Accelerate team for this huge multidisciplinary effort, and especially uh, my mentor, Dr. Natasha Lake, for all your support for the past two years. And also I would like to thank all our patients and their family for their participation in the study and the foundation donors for your support in this project. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Miguel. And again, we'll open it up for questions. If you've got questions, please feel free. You can use the raise the hand feature to shout it out if you prefer. And, and maybe while people are thinking, you know, one of the things that always strikes me, Miguel and Natasha, compared to what I, I trained, is the blurred lines now between scientist and clinician. And then I often think now that the oncologist and hematologist needs to be well versed in molecular biology. You know, maybe Natasha, you can comment on your perspectives. You train maybe a little closer to me and Miguel, you know, your perspectives as you train more recently. I, I agree with you completely, Erin. And I think it's been great. I think that a lot of what we spend time now trying to teach other oncologists and, and teach patients as well is how to understand some of this new technology, how to understand the science and how it relates to people in their treatment. Um, and it's actually been a little more challenging than we thought. You know, some of these great new technologies lead to answers and results that can be very hard to interpret. Um, so it's actually led to sort of more education in between the two worlds. It's also been really great for us. You know, it feels as though every year there's a new technology, uh, you know, through programs such as this, where we can invest and really make a huge difference to patients. So it's really been a fantastic two-way street. Super. Thank you. You know, why don't we go, because I want to make sure we've got time for, for our questions. Let's go to Karen. Hi, uh, Aaron and, and Dr. Garcia, Dr. Light. Thanks very much for your presentation. It's very exciting. Um, just wondering if there are commercial applications to this liquid biopsy that you are working on. I know that uh, 
many uh, a few of your colleagues uh, in in Princess Margaret uh, have done it for uh, prostate and others and whether there's a you're taking this on the road so to speak and looking at the commercial uh, aspects of this I think it's incredibly exciting it's it's really transformative um, I think we all know people unfortunately who passed of lung cancer and the time from diagnosis to treatment seems an eternity and this this sure can shorten it and it's exciting to see the results already and I I'm just wondering how you you know if there is commercial applications for for this technology well, thanks so much. It's a great question. And because it's so exciting, it won't surprise you to learn that there are at least 10 liquid biopsy companies out there, you know, currently working on these projects with us. You know, I think from a, a Princess Margaret perspective, some of what we're going to do is to make this truly Canadian, you know, affordable, usable in the Canadian healthcare system. So to sort of um, split off a bit from the commercialization and make it more practical. But we're also working on ways to go even earlier. So for example, through the foundation, we're working on blood tests to try and pick up cancer even before we can see it on the scans so that we can offer more protect preventive treatments to increase the chance of cure or to follow a person's cancer treatment, make sure that they're on the right treatment at the right time. And so we are looking into uh, some commercial applications of that often in collaboration with, with some of the groups that you've already heard of, the group looking at methylation or multimodal assays, as well as some of the other groups. Thanks, Natasha. You know, to your point, Tom, that one of the companies in the space is actually our very own Dallas spun out of Princess Margaret Technology, really at the leaders of the field and also noteworthy that Drs. Bratman and DiCarvalo were recipients you know, years ago of invest in research funding that actually helped ultimately get them to where they are today. Uh, so I, if I've got it right, John, we're going to go to you next. For the yes, thanks very much. First of all, congratulations. This is very exciting. I had two questions. One, a couple of slides back, Miguel, you had a chart that showed, if I understood it, the folks going through this kind of liquid biopsy ended up more of the a higher percentage of those folks were getting targeted treatment at the end. Was that right? Versus uh, folks going through the normal process. Did, did I understand that right? Yeah, yeah, that's why, right. Why would Why would that be? That's not intuitive to me that that would be an outcome that you would expect. I'd expect at the end of the day, whether you went the slow route or the fast route, those percentages would be similar. What, what explains that? Do you want, I, I can take that one or, or Miguel, you can. You know, in, in lung cancer, unlike some of the other cancers um, that we treat, getting tissue samples is a real challenge. Often people are very sick, the samples are very small, and so it's not uncommon that we actually can't get enough tissue to do the testing. And so we've actually found that these liquid biopsies actually help us get the answer right more often. And so in other studies that we've done and programs that we've set up through the foundation across Canada, um, you know, we can rescue anywhere from 16 to 25% of patients that otherwise, you know, would not have any answers from tissue because there's just not enough or it's all taking too long. Whereas with plasma, you know, we get it faster, we get the answer and they can start something sooner. So it's a, a few a few factors in there. Um, but I agree, you know, in some other cancers where, you know, maybe the pace of disease is a little bit slower and maybe tissue is a little bit more accessible, you might see exactly what, what you've predicted, which is very similar outcomes. I think the plasma always gets you there first, so far anyway. Wow, so that's, that's really significant because it's not just the speed to treatment, it's presumably outcomes are better, which is, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a double double win, uh, which is interesting. My other question, just around, you mentioned, um, you know, aspiring to get this to be standard of care. What what are the barriers in doing that? Like, are these tests so complex that you know other hospitals can't do them, or what what what's the what's the barrier to kind of just getting this? Because it seems like a no brainer from, you know, every dimension, including cost. Thanks. I, I, I agree, personally. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that studies like this will enable us to show payers, governments, um, you know, Cancer Care Ontario and other programs that, you know what, this, this can save money. This definitely improves outcomes to so sort of building that um, business case or, or demonstrating clearly that this is, is the way to go for patients. The other thing is, you know, when we've done something a certain way for decades, it's very hard to get people to suddenly switch to a new way. There are people who are early adopters of new technologies and then people, for example, like the pathologists who might be a little more reluctant to say, okay, well, let's abandon tissue. 
let's not wait for that. And then also getting the two systems to speak to each other. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of things about the system that we also need to change to get um, this taken up. And that's also part of what um, Dr. Garcia and the team are gonna show. Um, not only that group of patients where we were able to get people onto targeted therapy really quickly, but also for that other half of people, you know, some of those people could get onto immunotherapy very quickly, or even if we had to chemotherapy faster, but how do we get people to trust those negative results? And so, um, you know, there's, there's a, a bigger story about sort of really promoting the trust um, in the liquid biopsy results to change practice and promoting that, that adoption, um, you know, across the country and, and beyond our borders. There are a lot of um, of our colleagues internationally who are very interested in this work. We well, have a fresh new, fresh new health minister tomorrow, so maybe that'll be a magic moment for us. <laughs> Fantastic. We're going to give the last question to him. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the presentation was very interesting, so thanks for sharing uh, all of that information. Um, I'm curious, of the 27% of patients uh, who started tar targeted therapy based on liquid biopsy prior to the tissue biopsy results coming in. I I'm curious if there were ever instances where liquid biopsy didn't necessarily uncover the full picture of the diagnosis that maybe the later scans and the tissue biopsy did, um, resulting in the need to maybe switch therapies uh, based on those extra data points that came in. Or was it that the liquid biopsy was always accurate and helping to choose the best targeted therapy every time? So it, it's a great question. And I think your question has even more relevance outside of lung cancer with other cancers. In lung cancer, we're a bit fortunate because when the test comes back as positive, it's very specific to lung cancer and type of certain treatment. So it's very unusual you know, incredibly rare, less than 1% of cases would have something come back in the tissue later that said, oh, you know, we could also consider another treatment. Mm. If there is what we call discordance where, you know, as, as you know, you know, we might see it in the liquid biopsy and not in the tissue, but it's still there. It's still real. People still benefit from the treatment or vice versa. You know, the, the, the plasma test might miss it. It might not be sensitive enough or the patient might not be, you know, that might not have enough breakdown of the cells and DNA and genetic material into the blood to pick it up, but it'll show up on, on in the tumor sample. And so that's about 10% on either side. Um, so they, they actually are very good complementary tests. And so if one's negative, you always want to see if you can, can get results from the other. Um, I think, you know, we've been very lucky in lung cancer, but I think with other cancers, you know, that will be very interesting. For example, um, Aaron and leukemia, you know, there are these mutations called JAK2 mutations. You can find them in blood cancers, but you can also find them in normal cells in blood that are just getting a little bit older. Uh, mm -hmm. and just sort of undergoing um, so we clonal hematopoiesis is what it's called and so that I think is where you know we need to take a little bit of extra time make sure we're filtering in anything that is you know sort of missense or not relevant to the patient um, in our study we've been very lucky even when we thought the patient had blood cancer but they didn't the liquid biopsy was actually very helpful and pointed us in the direction of what the pathologist eventually said the cancer wow great okay thank you fantastic thanks so much you know again I I want to just again thank you so much for your incredible support of this program. I hope, you know, like me, you continue to be in awe of the great work by our scientists and clinicians every day for doing such fantastic things. Let me turn it back then to, to you, Michael and Jared, if you'd like to make some uh, closing comments. Thanks, Aaron. And, and thank, uh, I want to thank everyone for their participation today. Donors, uh, guests of Re Invest in Research, the research scientists, it's been truly amazing and thank you for your presentations. Um, we're grateful um, to all of our members and encourage you to continue to reach us to discuss the program, as well as to tell your friends and colleagues about Invest in Research and these great initiatives. Without your support, groundbreaking ideas would remain as ideas and not become pathways to conquering cancer. So all the best, and we hope that you and your family have a safe and relaxing summer. We'll see you next fall for our annual meeting. Thank you.